recording and it's all over to you. Me Lovely. Everyone. Thank you, Mish. Hi, everyone. I, I do get to do an official like hello now. So wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing your story because that is so important, um, particularly when we do online training because we're just all faces behind a screen. So that was so lovely. Thank you. Um, so did, I guess maybe like a show of hands or a thumbs up. Did I meet any of you virtually at the Tech Expert Summit a couple of weeks ago? Some thumbs up, thumbs down. If I didn't, you can thumbs down me a few thumbs up. Awesome. Oh, like I've got like a mix. Lovely. Thank you. I got two thumbs up from Emily enthusiastically. I like that. Meg is like a big thumbs down. <laughs> Beautiful. So, um, so some of you know me, some of you don't. Um, so little, really brief background. So I'm coming to you from Melbourne. Um, well, Victoria, Peninsula, Moynton Peninsula, much more south from Melbourne. But um, much like I think Isabella said, working at home was actually my norm mixed with trouble. Um, so that, you know, it's good. I'm kind of quite settled. Um, and yeah, really, it was thinking about the win and challenge thing, Michelle, um, my win totally is just being grateful for having a job, having an awesome boss and having an organ, working for an organization that can pivot in these times and really reshape what we do. So um, yeah. And challenge is really interesting. Challenge is actually uh, the energy involved in delivering and working online all the time. And I don't know if um, the rest of you have found this, but it does take a very different energy um, to be in a lot of video calls all day and all that kind of thing. So I read some interesting research about it actually, but so I'm very glad that you've all got your cameras on because actually the most draining thing is talking to a blank screen. So I will say thanks so much for that. And yeah, I see a few people, you've probably found the same thing, Michelle, when all the cameras are off and no one turns it on, it's very, very disturbing. So yeah, thank you so much. So I've been working with G Suite for just over 10 years now. Um, as we said, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about it. So my big thing um, is helping people be more efficient and more organized with their day-to-day -day communications. That what, that's what I'm passionate about. So the fact that some of you have said today, you know, um, I use Outlook at work, or I use Gmail personally, all of that. That's actually really cool because what I'm going to talk today is in the Gmail context, but I'm also going to talk about principles in terms of managing and being organized with your day-to-day -day communications. So no matter what platform you use, I like to think you can take those principles and then adopt them elsewhere as well. So without further ado, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so I've gotten, I had to sort of go, oh, I don't have a lot of time. So what would be the top things I would share? And I've written down three main things I want to talk about. Um, but totally happy to take all of your questions. The more questions you ask me, the more excited I get. So I've got the chat on the side of my screen ready to go. So please feel free to do that. Um, so hopefully I'll just check. Can I get a thumbs up if my screen share is working? Cool. Ah, oh, you guys are great. Awesome. So don't mind when I'm looking to the side at you. That's why you get the side of my head, but I'll keep an eye on you at the same time. Okay, so here we are in Gmo, And the three things I really want to talk about today are around searching, archiving, and then actually having a system for managing your inbox. So I'm gonna start, start with search and archive. They're, they are two of what I consider four of the, four of the key concepts of Gmail. Um, so if you are, uh, particularly if you're using it for work, I think these are super important because we spend a lot of time digging through inboxes and finding things. But as I said, regardless of whether you're using it personally or what platform you might be using at work, the principles are still the same. So let's start with search. Now, this is actually probably even more important than Gmail than any other mail tool you've used in your entire life, basically because I always remind myself that Google is a search company and their products are built around the concept of searching. If you do use other G Suite products, it's the same deal in all of those as well, particularly Google Drive. So learning how to search effectively is key. Now, where people tend to go wrong with search is that they search really ineffectively um, and inefficiently. And the way they do that is they just come up to the search box and they pop in a keyword, whether that be a name or a keyword or whatever, and just push enter and kind of hope for the best and see what happens. Now, typically what happens is when you do that, oh, typically you don't get a loading. It usually comes up straight away. Typically, there you go. You get a whole lot of results with that keyword in it. Now, this happens no matter what product you're in, and generally it's because it's doing such a broad search. So while we think we're saving time just by popping a word in and pushing enter and it takes us all of two seconds, we're then having to actually go through our search results and find what we want. Now, recently, Gmail has actually added a really cool little um, tool called Search Chips is their official name, um, where it actually pops these little 
um, boxes down the bottom here after you've done a search to help you kind of refine that search. So I think that's really good. Um, having said that, I reckon you can even be smarter with it and actually start by searching smarter from the beginning. So what I do is instead of just popping a, a word in here and hoping for the best, I use the drop down arrow here and that brings our advanced search box. Now, if you're an Outlook user, you in Outlook have advanced search um, at the top. And I actually have um, a blog post where I've written about searching effectively in Outlook. I've got one for searching effectively in Gmail. I've got one for searching effectively in Outlook. So what I might do, um, Michelle, is after the session, I might email everyone on that group those couple of posts. So that way you can apply those principles no matter what you're doing. Um, so key thing is, if you spend 20, 30, whatever, 40 seconds, using these advanced search operators, you are going to find what you want quicker and easier. So a couple of key things I recommend that you do. First of all is use the from or the to field. Now this might sort of sound obvious, but if you just search for a person's name or a person's email address, you're gonna find everything to them, from them, CCC, BCC, the whole lot, right? Whereas if you just use the from or the to field, you're gonna really limit that down straight away, cut down some results. So to me, the principle of search, it's not so much about pinpointing what you want. I think a good search excludes all the things you don't want. So what you do want is just there ready for you. So with that kind of in mind, you can then start to actually use these boxes. Now, I just saw a question pop about how did I get to the search screen again? So I'm actually gonna show that before I go on just so that if you are looking at yours, you can follow. It's just that little drop down arrow at the edge of the search box there. All right, so we'll definitely use from or to. Now, a really key thing to understand is the difference between subject and includes the words. So the other reason you get a lot of results in Gmail is when you pop in a keyword, um, like, like a project name or something like that, it looks in the body of the email, it looks in the subject, and it can also look in some of the linked attachments as well. So that's where you get a lot of results back. So if you're like, I definitely just want something where this keyword was in the subject, then you should pop it in there, all right? But if you don't know the subject, then you would stick with using this one. All right, so I'm not gonna go through every single one. I'm gonna pinpoint the ones that are most important. And one of them is this one here, date within. So I think like I know um, a couple of the ladies from, from Borrell were saying they've been using Gmail for a couple of years now. Um, I myself have been using it for many years. So if I was to do a search, I'm getting search results back years and years and years and years, right? Lots and lots of results. So something you can do straight away to, to again, cut out all the stuff you don't want is to actually use the date within. So if you know that it was something you got in the last month, two months, six months, whatever, you can actually pop that in. So that's great. I'm going to go, let's just say like six months. But a key thing with this is if you put something in this box, it doesn't actually do anything until you put something in this box here. And that is, a, that is actually telling it what date to start with. So it's really interesting because if you've got nothing in here and you do the search, this does absolutely nothing. And it often catches people out because they're like, I don't understand. It doesn't work. That's right. It doesn't work unless you actually come and select the starting date. So for me, I usually click in here and just click today unless I want to look search for a different period of time. And I've got that there. So other one that can be really, really um, useful is has attachment. So again, like quite often people say to me, I'm searching for an email because I want the attachment that was on it. So if you know that that's the case, all you need to do is tick has attachment. And when you do your search, it's going to strip out everything that doesn't have an attachment. So straight away, you know that you're excluding that stuff you don't want. All right, so I'm just going to pop something in here. Now, to be honest, I've actually, this is a new demo account that I've just switched to. So let's really go with that person. So to be honest, I'm going to do a search and something probably isn't going to come up, but that's okay because I want to show you what happens when I do a search using these. So if I click search now, you'll see up the top, forget the fact that I got no results, you'll see at the top that it's actually popped in the criteria. So you can learn that if I type the word from colon and then type an email address, and I actually don't even need the brackets, um, and if I type has colon attachment, that's how I tell Gmail what I'm looking for. There's after and before that talk about dates. 
So if you do enough of these searches, you just very naturally be able to give them to you that language in the search box. And then from there, you can just go forth and it, it's really nice and easy. So that's some tips about search. Now, another really quick one I'll just show is if you uh, wanna find emails from a particular person, a really quick way to do that as well is if you just right click on the email from a particular person, you can then actually go find emails from that particular person. So if I was to do this now, it would just find all the emails that Jake had sent me, so from Jake, and it would bring all of them up. So that's something I use as well as like a really quick way to do it. All right, I'll turn to the camera. All good with that? Does that make sense to some general principles? Brilliant. Yep. Yeah, I love the thumbs up and thumbs down. Feel free to go with that. And that's that's lovely. I know Zoom has it. I was gonna say Janelle, Janelle's son. I know there's virtual thumbs up and thumbs down. If you've got your camera off, you can do that as well. Lovely. All right, and as I said, I'll send around the article that applies them to the Outlook world as well. So then you can see a similar thing. Now, what I will oh no, actually, I'm gonna show you this one first. So that was key concept number one, searching. Now, key concept number two is something called archiving. So let me just open an email, I'll just scroll down and let's just open, let's open this one. So there is a button in Gmail, oh, there's slight delays today. There is a button in Gmail up here, which is called archive. So for those Gmail users on the screen, I would love to know, and you might wanna tell me this in chat or else you can turn on your microphone if you wanna tell me. I would love to know if you have ever looked at that button and gone, I am too scared to use it because I don't know what it does. Has anyone had that? I can see Tracy nodding. Is anyone else? Oh, Catherine's giving me a thumbs up. Yeah, and same with Susan. Yeah, that is like the most fearful button in Gmail. Um, and generally when I do this in a face-to-face, -face, people are like, I pushed it once and I didn't know what happened to my email. So then I got, never touched it again. So that's, that's quite often what happens. But I love, Danielle's just popped into chat and they're going, I use it. I'm like, great, Emily and Danielle. Wow, that's awesome, cool. So I would be interested then to you two ladies, do you wanna, before I even go into explaining it, do you wanna tell me in the chat what you think it does? So I'm actually looking for a very specific answer here, but I'd be really keen to hear your interpretation of it. And yeah, would love you to pop that in there. Now, while you're doing that, um, again, newer um, versions of Outlook actually have a similar button. And again, the concept is similar. It's not exactly the same, but the principles of why I'm going to talk to, uh, about that being useful is, is really quite good. So, um, so we'll see. I was going to give Danielle and Emily a chance. They're pondering now, I think, to like, mm, do I want to type in? Oh, okay. Danielle, fantastic. She's got remove the email from your inbox, but you can still find it in the search. Remove the inbox label. Woo, Emily, so can I just say that your answer there removes the inbox label is so spot on. Danielle, yours is very, very much true as well, but it's gonna, they're gonna be beautiful for what I'm gonna talk about. So on that note, let's have a look at this, right? So inbox over here is just a label like all of your other labels in Gmail. So when you have the inbox label on an email, it means that that email is shown in that spot, i.e. it's shown in the inbox. So what this button does, as Emily so beautifully wrote for us, is it actually removes the inbox label. So if I push it now, it's the same as actually pushing that little X. So that's what it does conceptually. Now, the question I usually get after that is like, okay, well, fine, but then where does the email go? Um, and both the ladies that responded to us said you can find it in search, which is 100% accurate. The question is where does it go is actually really interesting. And there's kind of two parts to it. So let's just say my email also has another label. And this is one of the key differences between Gmail and say Outlook is that in Gmail, an email can have multiple labels applied to it, which means it's then visible in multiple places. It's kind of like putting multiple sticky notes on a physical piece of paper. So you're labeling it with those post-it notes, for example, as opposed from like putting it in a folder, a traditional folder, if you think of like an old school filing cabinet where you'd have to physically copy, photocopy something to put it in multiple folders. So that's kind of the difference between a traditional folder you might see in other tools and a label. A label gives you a lot more flexibility. So back to the point, if you've got this email with two labels, admin emails and inbox, 
If I push that archive button, it's going to click, it'll take off the little inbox label here, which means it will be in admin emails. Easy. But if it doesn't have that, and it's just got inbox, what happens is if I push that archive button, where does it go? So if it's not in the inbox, the only place left for it to be is actually this location, which is hidden down under the more section in your email, Gmail label list. This little section here called all mail. So all mail is something that is common to every single Gmail account. And what is in it is everything except your spam and your bin items. So every single other email in your account is in all mail all the time, regardless, as the name kind of suggests. So if you archive something and it's no longer in the inbox, it's in all mail. Now, just sort of a side note, if your all mail spam and bin are tracked down the bottom here under more, I actually suggest that you just click and drag them and it drops them up to the top here. So I just think it's good having them up there, particularly like spam and bin, which you might need to look at. You can just quickly get to them. So that's sort of a side note, but you might want to move all mail up there as well. So the reason this becomes super useful is some people, and this may be not you, but it may be your boss or a colleague. Some people are not great at filing. So we're kind of taught, you know, over the years, since I think we've all started first using email, that the correct way to do email is that you have a whole detailed structure on the left here and that you diligently file stuff away into that structure because that's the only way you're going to be able to find something. So this might have been true years ago before the advent of really powerful search. So now because we have really powerful search features, once you know how to use them effectively, you don't necessarily need to maintain a massively deep or broad um, file structure, fold structure to be able to find something. So if you find yourself, or as I said, a colleague or your boss or something like that um, is not a very diligent filer and you tend to know that because you look at their inbox and they have hundreds or hundreds or thousands, or in my case, I've met people with hundreds of thousands of emails in their inbox because they just can't seem to file. What you can do is instead of mucking around filing, you can just click that archive button. So the email is out of the inbox, but you haven't actually had to spend the time filing it. Now, some people listening to this will be horrified at the thought, and I will be completely honest and say, I am a person that still has a very detailed folder structure because that's what works with my brain. But there are some emails which I look at and go, okay, that doesn't really fit in one of my folders and I'm not going to create a folder just for one email. So I archive it instead. So I've kind of found a balance. Now there are, archiving does, once you understand that, it then does open other possibilities. And I will send around a couple of blog posts about this. So a couple of the possibilities it opens up once you understand archiving and search is to do an inbox spring clean. So I don't know if anyone thinks that their inbox might need a spring clean or whether maybe their executive's inbox need a spring clean. Can I get thumbs up for anyone that's like, yes, spring clean? Yeah, there's a few thumbs up. Brilliant. So good news. I've got spring clean articles for Gmail. I've also got spring clean articles for Outlook. So I'll, again, I'll send all of them so that it doesn't matter what platform you're using. So you can learn how to spring clean your inbox. But before you do that, you need to know the two concepts that I've outlined. So definitely something you can do. I've done this exercise with people, as I said, over 100,000 in the inbox and we've got them down to just a few thousand, which then becomes manageable for them to start working with. So I'm a big advocate of inbox zero um, as, a, as a philosophy. All right, so I'll take a breath. Any other questions? You're welcome to turn on your microphone before I go into my next little bit or any questions in the chat? Good. Cool. I hope you've picked up a few little things so far. Good a few nods. Lovely. All right. So next bit, I, and this is sort of what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the session today, is really around this system of finding a, a way to manage your inbox and a technique for processing your mail. So um, that's what we're going to. That's what we're going to go into. Now, before I do that, I've just seen Susan's pop a, pop a chat message in, so I'm going to have to quick look at that. So um, when, you're, when you archive with different labels, does it save them into respective folders? Does that make your inbox size huge? Oh, excellent question, Susan, and, and apologies, I should have actually emphasised this. So 
When you um, put different labels on an email, it doesn't actually make a copy of that email. So there's only ever one copy of every email in Gmail. There's actually like no way to like copy it. Like, so there's just always one email and you could have a hundred labels on that one email, but it's always just one email visible in multiple places. So no impact on inbox size whatsoever because it's just still one email. So hopefully make that sense. And that's actually a key difference to like Outlook land Whereas if you wanted something in multiple folders, you'd have to make a copy of it. So yeah, Gmail sort of much more efficient in that respect. All right, so I've simulated um, on this account here, this training account, how I actually work day to day in my normal inbox. So um, I'm gonna talk about the principles behind this in a minute, but I'm just quickly gonna show visually what it looks like. So key thing, a lot of the training I've you know, done over many years is I find a common theme um, and probably some of you may have heard this if you're at my session that I did um, for the summit. The theme that I discovered was that a lot of people's method for managing their mail, and when I say managing, I'm not talking like filing so much, like managing the things they need to do in their email. So a lot of the method was the mark unread system. So pretty much how the mark unread system works is you open your inbox, you open a message and you go, oh, okay, that's important. I need to do something with that. So I need to remember to do something with it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to mark it unread again. Now, that's kind of like the base level system. Some people then would be like, like, oh, no, I might put a flag on it or I might put a star on it or something like that. So some people kind of take the next step. Often it's still marked on red again, even if it has like a flag or a star or something. So I'm going to turn a look. Has anyone used the mark on red system themselves? Yep, a couple of thumbs and mostly nods, yet smiles. I love the smiles. This is great. So usually when I do this face to face, I have people like, yes, that's totally me. That's, that's cool. Like that's a lot of people have always done. The problem, and I probably don't even need to tell you this, so you're probably thinking already. The problem with the mark on red system is that you do that, you go up to a meeting, you go up to lunch, you come back to your inbox and you've now got another 10 unread emails mixed in with the 15 that you'd actually already read, but you marked unread again because you had to do something. So you are continually evaluating and reevaluating your inbox to actually see what do I need to do? What do I need to read? So it's not clear. So how I've overcome that in my world is actually using this kind of setup in my inbox. So I actually have a label created for follow-up and a label created for waiting for. Now, if you are an Outlook user, you can create customized categories with exactly the same name. So I have a same kind of system for this I, that I talk about with my Outlook customers. So once I've got those labels, I then use them to mark my messages. So I do not mark stuff as unread again. If something needs to get done, and I've got a decision process for that, which I'll talk about in a minute, but if something needs to get done, then the follow-up label goes on it. If something I am waiting for, the waiting for label goes on it. And this is super important because often we have stuff left in our inbox because we're waiting for people to get back to us. And I know when I brought this up at the summit, I had like a hundred comments of people going, that is my life, we're EAs, we're continually waiting for people, like that is huge. So there you go, often you leave it in your inbox because you're waiting. So you can use this system instead. So pretty much how it works is I come in, I open an email message and I say to myself, do I need to do something with this? And I use the principles of getting things done, which is a great methodology. If you've never looked into it, it's around task management and time management. So based on that principle, which is actually also where follow-up and waiting for come from, based on that, I say to myself, do I need to do something with this? If the answer is no, then I file it, archive it, forward it, like whatever, get it out of the inbox. If the answer is yes, then I say to myself, can I do it in two minutes or less? And if the answer is yes, then I do it, assuming that I have two minutes. Because purely the fact that, okay, I'm going to put a label on it, I'm going to switch cognitive modes, come back to it later, it's just not worth my time. If it takes two minutes or less, just do it. If I'm like, I do need to do something, but it takes more than two minutes, that's where I actually come up and pop the follow-up label on. If I don't want to sort of do it this way by clicking on that, I can just drag over the follow-up label that way, done, okay? So you can quickly drag over to Gmail just like that, sorry, Gmail labels over just like that, 
or even if it's still in your inbox, you can actually drag over like this as well and drop a, drop a label on. So that's like a little side tip. So pretty much I work through each item in my inbox. I'll just take that one off and apply the labels. So at the end, generally I have zero in my unread section. Then I have a whole lot for follow up and some that I'm waiting for. And I'll talk in a minute about how I get these different sections because I know we've only got a few minutes, so that's okay. Um, any questions about that before I go in and sort of show you how I get the different sections? Does that kind of make sense so far? Yep. Cool. What some people don't realize just briefly in Gmail is that you can actually label an outgoing message. So if you're actually sending an email and you know it's going to be something you really need to remember that you're waiting for, like I don't do this on every message. It would only be something that was high stakes. I had to make sure I got a reply. I wanted to follow up. Um, then I would come down to the little dots down the bottom here when I'm typing them out and in the label section, I would choose follow up or waiting for. And that, so usually waiting for, that actually labels the sent message. So then it puts the sent message in my waiting for section. All right, so if you're wondering how I got, okay, these different sections, cause you don't have to have it like that. You could just use the labels, but not have the inbox broken up into different sections. What that is, is actually in my settings, it's in the do, 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 just wait for it to load. in the inbox section. I've actually turned on something called priority inbox. Now the priority inbox lets you customize up to four sections. And what I've done is I've said I want my first section to be unread. So by default, it actually looks like this, right? It actually these are the settings. So if you were to go in and turn this on, it would not look anything like mine. So I've actually gone into each section and gone in and actually customized each section to choose what I want to show. So in this case, oops, I just want to show unread mail. In the second section, instead of showing stars, I want to actually show my follow-up items. The third section, I want to show my waiting for labels items. So you can kind of see how you could customize that for any system that you use. Now, again, like I appreciate, we don't have a lot of time. I'm giving you a kind of overview. I've got a video on setting this up. I've got an article. So I'll send all of that to you guys after so you can have a look in your own time and work through that. Now, Mish, how are we going for time? I think we were due to wrap about-ish now. Am I right? I don't want to... Five minutes? Cool. Okay, brilliant. I just didn't want to keep waffling. I could talk about this stuff for ages. So lovely. All right. So on that note, so once you've set this up, so I'm just going to go back and save it. And it's there. Just giving it a second. A little bit slow today. That's all right. So once it's set up and you've got that split, that's when you can really start using your follow-up section as kind of your to-do list in the inbox. And there's many different arguments about, you know, getting things out of the inbox and into a different to-do list and all of that. I don't have a strong view either way. What I tend to find is that even when people do that, there still tends to be things in the inbox that they're following up on. So I think it's useful having them in a dedicated section. So the only other tip to go, or two tips actually to go alongside this, if you are using this kind of setup, is don't mark emails unread again, like don't get into that habit. So if you put a follow-up label on it, don't go and mark it as unread as well, because otherwise it just shows in your unread section, not in your follow-up section. So you just need to make sure you do that. Um, the other key thing as well is that for each of these sections, if you do decide to use them, um, at the top you'll see mine says like 1 to 21 of 21. If I click on that little dots next to it, I can actually choose how many items or how many email messages I want in that section. So some sections you might want to be bigger, some sections you might want to be smaller. All right, so that being said, Thought I might just show you three quick hot tips to finish up. Some of these features you may know about, some of you might not, and then we'll, we'll wrap with these. So first one is, in addition to sort of what I've just told you, something that can be quite useful is the snooze option. So you can get this either by ticking an email or by opening the email and then you see the little button. I think you can right click it as well. So what Snooze does is actually let you send an email away from your inbox temporarily and then bring it back when, um, at a time when you want to actually action it. Now, the best example I heard about this um, was someone talking about how they manage their RSVPs. 
So this particular um, lady I work with, she gets invited to a lot of events. Um, she's kind of in the arts um, industry, a lot, a lot of events. And she said, often I get an email and they're like, you know, you're invited to this, the RSVB date is you know, 20th of June. But she's like, I won't know then and there if I can go. And I'm sure you've been in that situation, you've had your execs in that situation. So what she does, I thought was super smart, she snoozes the email until a couple of days before the RSVP date. So then of course it pops back up and then she can actually evaluate where she can go or not. So that's quite good. Um, I, in addition to using this system, I use snooze for anything that is time sensitive like that. So when you snooze it, it just pops it over here in snooze. So you can quickly find it again. It's not gone or anything like that. And then it will just pop up to the top. So that's the first one. The second one, is just knowing that it's there and how to use scheduled send. So if I click uh, an extra little send button here, you'll see there's schedule send. So that just lets you schedule the sending of an email for another time. So again, I use this in two ways. One is if I know I'm gonna be tied up at the time that something needs to go out. And that's often very standard things like, um, you know, an agenda for an event or something I'm running, a reminder, like I'll schedule that stuff. Um, I've also used it um, when I've been working in different time zones. So like I know um, uh, we had, who was it was from Western Australia was joining us. So like um, often even within Australia, we're dealing with multiple time zones and I want to make sure that something lands in someone's inbox at 9.30 because I know that's probably when they're going to be looking at their mail and I'm probably more likely to get a response. I'll schedule that. Also great if people, if you are in the habit of working very early or very late that you don't want your colleagues to feel pressured into replying to you at those times, scheduled send is also really good for that. So last tip, and then I'm gonna wrap up, is how to make the compose box bigger. That is a question I get asked all the time. Um, and there are a minimum of five ways to do this. So I'm gonna wrap them today with my, my tips around that. So particularly if you're an Outlook user, you can come in here and go, wow, it's really small. So number one way that most people have already discovered is clicking this little arrow here and it actually pops it into kind of this full screen mode. However, often that's not enough. Often we actually want it to be a separate window. Now I'm just thinking the way I've shared my screen today, you're probably not gonna see this, so you're gonna have to trust me. So when I hold the shift key and push this little arrow, you'll see that it'll disappear from what you're seeing, but it's actually popped up for me in a completely separate window that I can drag to a separate monitor, I can make huge, I can make smaller, I can move around. So just like in Outlook, how a message would open in a separate window. Other thing you can do if you hold the control button, you can click that as well and it will pop it into a whole new tab. So there you go, so you might have multiple messages up there and you can hold control or shift on existing messages as well and it will pop them into new windows or tabs. So lastly, is you can also use those keyboard shortcuts, control or command if you're on a Mac, and shift to hold them down when you're pushing the compose button. It will then open again an email in a new window or a new tab just by pushing the compose button with that. All right, now I've got one question. So do you have to be logged into Gmail for the schedule sent to work? Oh, fantastic question, Jill. No, don't need to be logged in at all, just does it. So that's what I like about it as well. All right. So shift plus C does it too. Shift plus C to do the new window one. Is that how you do it, Margo? I'm just gonna have a quick look. No, I don't I don't use my mouse, so I do everything on the keyboard. So shift oh. C gives me a nice, nice sort of big window to type in. Cool. So that's it. that's super interesting. So if I was to do it here, I was gonna say I haven't actually um haven't done that one before. Oh, I don't know if I've got, oh, haven't got keyboard shortcuts on in that account. Probably that's why. You do need to jump into your settings and turn keyboard shortcuts on if you're gonna use that one-on-one. -on -one. Excellent, thank you, Margaret. See how I said there was a minimum of five ways? Now I can totally say there's more. So I love that, thank you. All right, wonderful. I hope that was helpful, everyone. Um, any other final questions? As I said, I'll send around the links so I didn't even say at the start, I'm from Using Technology Better. That's our company. So you'll get an email from me at Using Technology Better with the, um, the blog posts and the videos and that kind of stuff. Just uh, thank you, Sam. Does anyone have any questions like something that, and no question is silly, by the way. So throw yeah. anything out, can be basic to events. If there's something that you really are struggling with in G Suite at the moment with your Gmails, I mean, obviously our inbox is crazy at the moment. So the, the, yeah. the more we can get out and the more we can get done is, is, is fantastic. So Tracy's got a question for you, Sam. Mm. 
Oh, a head. What has she said? Can you see the question? Oh, hang on. What is the difference between labeling and putting the email in a folder? Oh, excellent question. So, oh, I should probably quickly share my screen for that actually at the moment. So let me just quickly do that because that's a really good point. I'm just thinking too, what I'll include in the email that I send you guys is I've got a blog post which talks about um, how, it's called How Do Gmail Labels Work? And it actually explains that concept, but I'll talk through it now too. So essentially, right, if I open uh, up an email, so let's I'll just check. Sorry, I'm a little bit slow. Um, up here, you've got a move to and a label button. If I use move to, it removes the inbox label and just puts it in, puts another label on it. So it's, or then it means it's only showing in the label on the left, right? It's not in the inbox. So it's moving it out of the inbox to the label. If I use the label button, it leaves it in the inbox and adds another label as well. So that's kind of the difference. One's moving, what moving, one's just putting another label on. So yeah, hopefully that makes sense. If you actually drag and drop an email, which you can do, um, you can just like drag and drop like this. See how it says move as well? That would tell you it's taking it out of the inbox and just popping it. So that's really the only difference is whether it remains in the inbox or not. Cool. All right. Okay. Any others? I think we're probably pretty good. Amazing. Everyone's quiet. They are. <laughs> well, if no one has any other questions, um, I um, will send the recording out later. Sam has promised us some great follow-up notes, which is great. And I think it's always good to go back to because we can do it in our own time. And when we've obviously got an example or we've got something there that we need to know how to do it. So I think that's fantastic. Um, but yeah, guys, um, go and be amazing. Have a great week. I know that lots of you are... Uh, your business is probably making decisions about going back to work and all those crazy things. But, you know, all this stuff that you've learned during the last three months during COVID, um, using technology is fantastic and we need to embrace it when we go back into the workplace. So don't stop the conversations. Don't stop the connection. Don't stop the questions. Um, Sam is fantastic. She's, she's always available. Connect with her on LinkedIn. Um, but remember to con continually ask the questions and collaborate with others. So, um, ladies, have a fantastic Tuesday and I'm sure I'll see you soon. I'll send the recording out shortly. Um, and Sam will do that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.